She grew up a child in the early 50s in uh, Pasadena, California. She was black and her family was poor. They attended a fundamentalist Baptist church. And if that didn't you know, make things hard enough for this young woman, she was also really tall not just for girls, but like really tall for all the kids in her class and very painfully shy. And so Octavia Butler learned how to tell herself stories very early. She spent a lot of time alone telling herself stories, coming up with imagined things, imagined worlds, imagined people, and that was what she did with her time. And most of those stories at that time weren't really fantastical things, they were just kind of make believe in her mind about what could be. But then she saw a B-rated science fiction movie. You know, one of those that's like, not that high of a budget, probably didn't look very good, but enough notoriety that it was playing on television. You could rent it at the Blockbuster. Well, not at the Blockbuster at that time, but enough notoriety that was playing on television and, and something that she would see. And it was called Devil Girl from Mars. And she watched this movie and she thought, at nine years old, this is terrible. <laughs> I could, somebody, somebody got paid to write this. And then she thought, I could tell better stories from that. And something in that bad B science fiction movie spoke to her soul. For some reason, it called to her. And from then on, she decided that she wanted to be a science fiction writer. And that's how it all began for her. And she would write these things on, on papers in her room. And there was an exhibit a few years back at um, a museum in California that had lots of her notes and scribbles from when she was a child. And one of them said, I am a best-selling writer. I write best-selling books every day in every way. I am researching and writing my award-winning books. She wrote that for herself as a kid with no evidence for it to stand on with nobody backing her up and telling it was true, with no other black women science fiction authors who could be, who were known of to be looking to, she just saw it in herself and believed it and proclaimed it. Here we arrive today at a really interesting intersection with the scripture that we hear too. So in the scripture and in last week's uh, celebration of Christmas, so in Christmas you have this young family, Mary and Joseph, pregnant Mary, they travel to Bethlehem to do their municipal duty, to respond to the call to be counted as they were supposed to be counted in the city of, of their ancestors in Bethlehem. And there, of course, Jesus was born and began this Christmas celebration. And this week, we have Mary and Joseph responding to their faithful duty, as it's written in the law of their faith, to go to the temple and have the child blessed and dedicated to God and to do the purification rituals of the time. And so you've got the, the thing that kind of runs the world intersecting with a thing that sort of runs the call of faithfulness. And we have that too. Here we have, we're celebrating New Year's Eve. We're sitting in an important calendar date and we're also sitting in the midst of this Christmas story. This Christmas story, which is so like what Octavia Butler saw in herself and proclaimed. What Simeon and Anna saw in the baby Jesus and proclaimed. It's a lovely thing that the author of Luke does here in this, of pairing a male who is of importance, who is of faithfulness, who comes and says a good word about the child, and then an elderly female in the community who is named the one who is the prophet, who comes forward and gives the word, gives, says, she doesn't, we don't know what exact words that she said, but we know she was the prophet, and we know she is the one who <laughs> proclaimed that Jesus is the one who's going to set the world free the claiming of the big thing that doesn't have any legs beneath it, that doesn't necessarily have any evidential foundation, that just she feels it in her soul and she knows it. She sees the possibility and the potential in this tiny little thing, in this little thing that doesn't have words, that just makes noises and is fully dependent on the people around him. All of the possibility that's contained right there and the vision for it too that the birth of Jesus shines more brightly than what we see in the world around us. What we see in the world around us now is a very difficult thing. 
And it's like Holly said to us last week on Christmas Eve, before we can do anything else to change the world, we have to be able to imagine a changed world. We have to be able to imagine life without the pull, the chain to addiction, life without hunger, a world without injustice. We have to be able to see it before we can even begin to move for toward it. And then we start taking the steps toward it. And on my best days, I think with God, all things are possible. I think with this community, I'm not alone. We are not alone. We get to go forward and we get to do God's work in the world. And then there is the hard part, which is most of the other days when we look around at the reality of the world and what we see is a war that started nearly 90 days ago where the death count is just mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. What we see is hunger that persists. What we see is injustice that wittingly or unwittingly, just by the fact that I, had to, I got a new phone the other day, I'm participating in injustice. Just thinking about the broader scope of the world, sometimes what that does to us is it just shuts it all down. All those calls that we've made to our representatives, what have they done? All the ways that we live for justice on one hand and then on the other hand, participate in injustice, what is it doing? And we kind of do the same thing that we tend to do with like on a small level with New Year's resolutions. We set these big goals and aspirations for ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we just dream so big, you know, it's like, I'm gonna wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and go work out. Well, I don't know the last time I got up at 5 a.m. to go work out once, let alone going straight to doing it every day. And then comes the first day when you sleep through the alarm and you don't go and it's over. You blew it, it's done, I, I failed. I have not followed through on what I thought I could do and I give up on it and move away from it. But really things exist in such different ways than that. That is not the way, like we are not wired to operate in that way. So let's think about it in different ways. Octavia Butler, instead of saying, well, there are no other black science fiction women authors who I know of who are successful, instead of saying that, she just kept writing. You know, every day she would write. She would write something. She would make these science fiction dreams come to life. She would, she would put pen to paper and imagine worlds that hadn't been before. And she looked back at the way specifically black people had been written out of history, where the people who got to tell the story, and this is very specifically true, um, especially in the world of publishing, where the people who got published, the stories that got told were the the white authors, the people who had power. And for so long, these other voices weren't picked up by the people who had the money and the influence to push those voices out there. And so she visioned a future and said, I am going to, I'm going to think of the future differently. I'm going to imagine myself into the future. I'm going to imagine a future that is different. And it's this whole movement called Afrofuturism in literature. And uh, a lot of folks would even credit uh, Octavia Butler as the starter of this um, tradition, this movement, and she went on to write 12 novels that of, gr of great notoriety and even more manuscripts that never got published before her death in 2006. She was the first black woman to win a Nebula Award and a Hugo Award. Those are the top science fiction awards you can get in literature. She went on to won a um, MacArthur Genius Grant she went on to write and write so prolifically and so prophetically that we can't help but hear her words. Maybe you've heard of some of the books, Kindred, Parable of the Sower. And then she has these other theories too. One of the other signs that they had in this museum exhibit that said, tell stories filled with facts. Make people touch and taste and know make people, and she wrote these in all capital letters with an exclamation mark on every one, make people feel, feel, feel. She wrote and she kept writing. And one theory that she included in her science fiction novels, which, you know, it's funny to hear somebody say, I write science fiction, but I write stories filled with facts, because that's what she did. She wrote about this scientific notion called fractals. 
And I think I talked about it with you all really in the deep, deep days of COVID when we were all on our computers. But it's this beautiful scientific concept, which is true, true in the broadest scope of things. And she brought it into our lives very intimately that on the basic level of creation, on the basic, on the, like the structure of our DNA is this structure of the spiral. And that spiral can be seen from the very smallest building blocks of existence to the largest one. You've got the structure of the DNA, then you've got the tiniest seashells on the beach, and then you've got the patterns in storms and the way that hurricanes are formed and that spiral and tornadoes, and then you've got the shape of entire galaxies out beyond what we can see and what we can imagine, all echoing this tiny spiral. And she said, why don't we think about this thing that we know is scientifically factually true in our own lives as well? that what we are on the very smallest scale is what we are on the very largest scale too. So rather than looking out at our world, yes, let's hold the vision, let's dream of the world, but when we take action on those giant massive dreams, we can take action in that tiny spiral that's within us. Bring it smaller. Who we are is really boiled down to the tiniest things. Yes, the things we work for in our world, and then the things we work for in our community, and then down smaller, our relationships, smaller within ourself, smaller in the depths of our soul. What's to be real? What's to be isn't made in grandiose, magnificent, impressive feats. What's to be built is built in the everyday acts of the ways that we live, the foundational ways that we live. So we have this faithful call with the calendar year. What do you want to be? What do you want to be in your life? What do you want to be this year? What do you want to be right this very moment? Who do you want to be right this very moment? And it's this decision that we get to make, not that we have to make this decision, we get to make this, this beautiful act, this miracle that we get to hold in every moment of our lives, that we have this choice of if we're going to be people of compassion and justice and hope, people who dream for this world, people who, who do the big things, the medium things, the small things, the giving to the Christmas Eve offering, the showing up at the um, January 4th event to advocate for fair wages for people who are going to be building the new Royal Stadium, to, add, to then how we treat one another, how we treat ourselves, it all comes down to the tiniest way to live our truth. Maybe we don't set the goal of I'm going to read 30 books this year. Maybe we just set the goal of I'm going to read today something. So here we are. We show up in this world, we're like the seashell, we're like the DNA, we're like the tiny bite-sized ways that we can move in our world and make a change in our lives and in the lives around us. Because in that, in those little acts, in those tiniest things, is the potential of the whole world. It's like the baby Jesus, it's like what Simeon and Anna proclaimed, that the potential, the reality, the inevitability that it will all echo out into the world to create something of God's justice and peace. May it be so. Amen.